and welcome to Cult Movie Cult, where we watch and discuss the horrific, the obscure, and the flat-out strange from the other side of cinema. I'm Mark Dickerson. And I'm Jeremy Fink. And this is the fifth episode in our series X-Rated and Animated, The World of Ralph Bakshi, where we'll be digging into the work of a true and controversial auteur of animated cinema. Today we'll be discussing Bakshi's final feature film to incorporate animation to date, the 4% on Rotten Tomatoes classic 1992's Cool World. I got news for you, pal. I am not your ordinary doodle. I've been checking up on what these Noi dames have got going in the real world, and I want it! Don't you see? They're real. They've got power. When they touch something, they feel it. And when they taste something, they really taste it. And when they do it with a man, oh, they really do it. What can I say, sweetheart? I can't help you out in that department. All right, so we are going to discuss Cool World, and this is the last part of our Ralph Bakshi series. Uh, but first, we want to just go back a little bit, as we've done before, and talk about uh, a little bit of the in-between and what we haven't really focused on uh, in episodes, but we want to just touch on, because we are trying to look at Bakshi's career uh, as a you know complete thing, so uh, we want to discuss, uh, at least touch on these other aspects. So after American Pop, which was the last film that we discussed, um, and that was very, uh, I would say, widely acclaimed film, Jeremy. Uh, I mean, a lot. it was very well-received. Well Probably reviewed. maybe his best to Probably his in best his career, yeah. yeah. Most likely, yeah. Um so he made that film and then after that he made a couple other films that um it seemed more in line with things he he had already done. So he made Hey Good Looking, which is another kind of like uh urban tale um animated film, and then there was Fire and Ice, which was him returning to uh the fantasy elements that we saw in Wizards and Lord of the Rings. So he made those two films um he also he worked with apparently the rolling stones i guess he did like a video for them apparently um, it was a very from what i understand he he did a music video for the rolling stones it was a cover of a song called yeah harlem shuffle yeah. and apparently it was a very um problem ridden shoot oh really yeah apparently the the stones because half of it was live action and half of it was animated mm -hmm. and this was actually after a brief retirement uh, a, br a brief hiatus in Bakshi's career and you know an offer from the Rolling Stones is hard to turn down but yep. there was some live action stuff that they had to shoot and they only had one day and the Stones turned up late and Bakshi <laughs> apparently figure, right? yeah go figure <laughs> and apparently because they turned up late Bakshi ended up actually putting some of his own money into this music video hmm. um, which they were also on a very tight deadline because they wanted to get it done in time for I believe the Grammys Mm -hmm. So so it was kind of a nightmare shoot, but still, you know, for Bakshi, yeah. too good of an opportunity to turn down. Oh, I'm sure. Um, and he did go on to work with other artists. Apparently, he worked with David Bowie. Um, uh, incorporate Well, it was with the film we're going to talk about, Cool World. Um, and that was apparently really well received. Apparently, the music, the, the soundtrack for Cool World was very well received. A lot of people gave it accolades. Um, but the film itself, different story, which we're about to get into. But uh, so he... Did that, and he also he returned, uh, which I found interesting, to Mighty Mouse, uh, the New Adventures. Uh, it was a new series. He had worked on the older Mighty Mouse uh, in the '60s, I believe, uh, when he was working with uh, you know Terry Tunes and, and that part of his career. So he returned there as a supervising director and was overseeing that show, um, and that was that only lasted a year, '87 to '88, um, and then apparently he um, he was in a period of depression around this time. He was not. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lack of support uh, for his personal projects, mm -hmm. i.e., you know, Hey Good Looking and the fantasy film uh, Fire and Ice probably wasn't, you know, the, the blockbuster he was <laughs> he was hoping for there. So he had some setbacks um, and I guess a little bit of a dry period. Um, apparently he read Catcher in the Rye again and connected with uh, Holden Caulfield, who is, of course, the the narrator slash protagonist of that book. And that is one of those notorious books that, you know... Um, Salinger has been very steadfast about not creating a, a film or anything from his novel. And yeah. uh, uh, Bakshi, though, he he wanted to attempt it. I guess he really felt a connection with it. 
and he thought he could make it work cinematically, I guess, with animation involved, I'm assuming. Well, and um, I, th- I think what's interesting, and one thing throughout this episode to think about is Ralph Bakshi is a guy who really kind of valued, for lack of a better term, artistic purity. You know, he yes, really wanted to do what definitely. he wanted to do. He, he wanted the integrity to be in the work, but he's also someone trying to work in a Hollywood system, which in the 1980s was kind of post-Jaws blockbuster era so a lot of the movies that were coming out you know of course there were some amazing movies that snuck through but historically the 80s in america weren't considered an amazing time for auteur directors so this is conservative a bit conservative (laughs) and this idea that you know bakshi is is attracted to a book that's all about someone feeling like everyone around him are phonies Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, I think is is pretty interesting because it, it yeah. makes sense that someone who is in this corporate, you know, greed is good America, who's yeah. trying to be an artist, of course, is going to be rejected and put down. And I think that as we go into Cool World in just a minute here, that's something to keep in mind, mm-hmm. um, even though it changed over time what Cool World actually ended up being from the original vision. It is still something to kind of think about as we move forward. Yeah, definitely. It reminds me a lot of Terry Gilliam, we were actually just talking about 12 Monkeys before we recorded, but uh, it reminds me of Terry Gilliam, the, the director, and his relationship with Hollywood studios. Um, he has that love-hate kind of thing where he needs them, but he doesn't want to be a part of their system, and he's had a lot of back and forth, and a lot of things fall through. So yeah. um, it's kind of that, yeah, it's similar to uh, what Bakshi was, how he was in uh, acting, I guess, with his career in Hollywood. And so, yeah, uh, ultimately, of course, this... Uh, his version of The Catcher in the Rye did not come through to fruition because J.D. Salinger is a recluse who does not want anything to do with it. Turned him down. (laughs) So he turned him down. Um, So he, you know, he went on to other things. And now I don't know if he, we have to talk about the rabbit in the room here. I hate to use that (laughs) lame saying there, but uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit came out, right? So that was Mm -hmm. 1988. Um, And... I don't know if Bakshi saw this and was like, I want to do that or, you know, because we talked about, uh, I'll give him more credit than that because obviously we've talked about uh, a lot of his films during the series and he has always incorporated live action in his movies. Um, not to the d- the degree, I would say that uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit did it because that was revolutionary. I mean, that, that broke the mold uh, mm-hmm. when it came to merging animated characters with live action. So I wonder if he saw that and maybe it wasn't even about the idea. Maybe it was more like now we have the technology to do this. And I yeah. wonder if that really appealed to him. Um, well, well, and I also I also yeah. wonder if maybe it had something to do with the fact that Who Framed Roger Rabbit was such a success. It's also possible because I know that initially from in my research – into Cool World, Bakshi originally wanted to make Cool World as a horror film. Yes, which um, is very it, it wasn't yeah. kind of as we'll get into the story in a minute, but it has some definite parallels to Who Frame Roger Rabbit. But initially, mm-hmm. it was supposed to be tonally very different, and yeah. I'm wondering if that maybe had something to do with some studio interference, where he already Bakshi might have already had this idea for yeah. this live action animation combo, and then the mm-hmm. success of Who Framed Roger Rabbit allowed him yeah. to get the money he needed to make this. I'm sure um, that, yeah. So, that so it's a right. combination, mm-hmm. yeah. Because Bakshi, he, I, 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 from everything we've learned about him and have seen so far, he seems to be an original who wouldn't just do a project to capitalize on or copy yeah. another project. I, my personal opinion I would is agree. It, this mm-hmm. probably came more from, the, the, the parallels probably came more from the studio people and less mm-hmm. from Bakshi himself. Right. Who Framed Roger Rabbit, that film is a, basically a noir mm-hmm. with you know, a detective story with these animated characters in it. And I think in a certain way he was trying to do the same thing, but with horror. Uh, yeah. Because his, his original idea for, the, for this film, for Cool World, or I don't know what it was called at the time, but his original idea was uh, very much a horror film. And it was yeah. you know, almost like a straight horror film, but except it had that animation element to it. So it's, you can see a lot of parallels there. Yeah. But um, we'll go into... Uh, cool world now we'll talk about that and we'll go into a little bit what the actual story ended up being for it so uh right off the bat i just want to say that this movie is very 90s very 90s yes <laughs> from the music to the wardrobe to the actors um you get a very young brad pitt there uh mm-hmm. one of his first roles uh and he's he plays a character with a pretty uh tragic backstory yeah one so of the, one of the main characters, yep. But we can go into, yeah, you want to just cover what the, the basic plot is of this film? Yeah, so Cool World is a 1992 American live-action animated thriller fantasy film, so many genres, uh, directed by Bakshi and starring, as we mentioned, Brad Pitt, 
Kim Bassinger and Gabriel Byrne. And it tells the story of a cartoonist who finds himself in the animated world he thinks he created and is seduced by one of the characters, a comic strip vamp who wants to be real. And as we mentioned, there's also the Brad Pitt character who is a 1940s uh, soldier with mm-hmm. PTSD from World War II who gets he into... From the war, yeah. yeah, he returns from the war and gets into a pretty horrific motorcycle accident in which his mother is killed. And somehow in the course of that accident ends up in this cartoon world, which is referred to as Cool World, which kind of runs parallel to the real world. And then almost 50 years later, the cartoonist, played by Gabriel Byrne, finds his way into that world, which he believes he's created, but apparently has already been existing for all these years ahead of time. And he has <laughs> yeah. just channeled it into his work. So it's a little vague, but apparently... So in the within the film, uh, Cool World is supposed to be a comic book, I believe. Yes. Although at first it almost seems like a cartoon, I guess, because you are watching it play out in animation. Maybe that's why it feels like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but also the way he, you see him at the drawing board sketching and stuff like that, it seems like it's going to be a cartoon. But in re- So in reality of the film, it's actually this uh, very successful comic book series. Um, but they never really explain like what kind of series it is. It's a lot of uh, vagueness around what Cool World actually is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely impressive as a as a world, as an actual location for the film. I you know I think it's um, it has all those Bakshi elements in it: the seediness, the un- you know the underground urban uh, urbanness. <laughs> I guess you would say yeah. uh, the this, you know the seedy characters and everything. I think it's very Bakshi, um, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and you do get like a sense of, of, of what the world is, but it just, I feel like they never fully explain, explain, you know, I feel like it's very, uh, a little disjointed. And I think that's part of the reason maybe this movie doesn't work completely. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, um, before we go into the film, I just want to talk about like a personal thing with this movie. Um, uh, not really that personal, but <laughs> just yeah, my, my reaction. We're getting deep guess, here, Mark. <laughs> yeah. Deep with Cool World. <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, <laughs> nothing like that. It's just one of those movies. Um, I just want to talk about it because I, I don't know if you had the same feeling, and maybe not with this movie because you're uh, a little bit younger than me, Jeremy, but um, it was Cool World was one of those movies that seemed really like dirty and forbidden to me as a kid. Like I remember trying to sneak down like downstairs or like sneak peeks at the TV when it was on, like if my parents had, had it on and they happened to be showing it on tv or something um like i had obviously no idea who ralph Bakshi was at the time all i know was like that i saw this you know what, what looked like a crazy movie with wall-to-wall animation in it um so it's interesting because it appeals to kids for its animation but it's very much an adult film um in some ways almost more than some of his other films i mean wizards uh, comes to mind but like mm-hmm. you know as far as being like that was his family movie but yeah this is a very you know adult film it deals with adult things um and this one was actually not written by him um, as well. The writers of this are Michael Grace and Mark Victor. And I looked them up at a, like the most notable thing that I saw was Poltergeist they had written, which is pretty, well, actually, I guess maybe a little bit similar. Yeah, actually. <laughs> things, no, you things mentioned it. Yeah. The TV and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a little bit similar, but yeah, it's um, they deal with a lot of, looks like a lot of paranormal and horror type things. So it kind of makes sense. And especially, with uh, Bakshi's original idea for this, but so they they were the writers, and Bakshi was the director, and he took the reins and had a vision for the film, which of course got screwed up by the studio because that's what happens to him, and to many auteurs, I'm sure. You know, when they get when they get put into that Hollywood studio system, you know, it's it's hard to fight for what you want. It's hard to you know maintain your integrity. And we, as you said, Jeremy, I mean, when I think of Ralph Bakshi, I think of integrity, I think of an auteur, someone who does things his own way. Um, so I'm sure he clashed uh, even more than we know, even more than we read about. I'm sure there was so many uh, battles behind the scenes of this movie. Um, yeah. And, and, and as we mentioned, like a Terry Gilliam before, like th- yeah. this, this is a thing that kind of happens over and over again. And interestingly, as I kind of mentioned before, I, you know, I said we should try to keep the idea of Ralph Bakshi fighting against the studio system and, you know, this idea of people in suits who are making money decisions to influence creativity and to get into the meat and bones of the story a little bit, kind of the villain in this story is a really classic femme fatale um, played by Kim Bassinger. I thought actually pretty well. Yeah. Um, I thought I thought she was actually maybe the highlight of this film yeah, in terms of yeah. performance. Um, but her character's name is literally Hollywood, <laughs> like Hollywood. Holly space wood, wood I believe right. spelled H-O-L-L-I. And then W O U L D. 
Well, um, the tagline for this is Hollywood if she could. Wait, what is it? Uh, Hollywood if she could. Yeah, and, and she will. And she will. Yeah, and she, she will. will. Uh, uh, yeah. But, so, but no, classic, she was, yeah. Yeah, she was a pretty good, cla- yeah, classic femme fatale. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, apparently, apparently, according to Bakshi, Kim, Kim Basinger was partly to blame uh, for what ended up happening with the film. But we'll go into that when we get yeah. to the end of this, yeah. But what I, what I was getting to, though, is I think just the and this this decision might have come from the writers. I'm not sure. But I think just naming the villain of this film Hollywood, you know, I, I, I think that Bakshi in going with that decision and running with it kind of isn't. I mean, maybe it's just a play. Maybe it's just a cutesy kind of, you know, posh noir thing. But I also think there's a certain, you know, truth to it that clearly the enemy to Ralph Bakshi is hollywood at this point it's it's these people who are you know i pulling didn't, even apart. Make that, didn't even make that connection jeremy yeah and, <laughs> and you know and you think about what she does over the course of the movie uh, and it, it's the great, kind of yeah. thing where you know she it's the glamour and she mm-hmm. it's the seduction but and she wants to she wants to be real and like mm-hmm. but like it is it, it does run these weird kind of parallels with yeah. the the hollywood studio system and this fight that back she might be having where he knows he Definitely. should resist but it's just too glitzy and beautiful. But ultimately, the temptation is, yeah, ultimately the temptation or whatever mm-hmm. it is kind of ruins who, a man who's trying to have integrity. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so. she, she, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I honestly didn't even think of that till right now until you said that. Um, that's really cool, though. Uh, I wonder if that was that play there um, with yeah. behind the scenes. But anyway, so yes, yeah, you mentioned her character, Hollywood, and. I find her an interesting character. I mean, she's she's pretty one note, um, but mm-hmm. I, I find characters that are so driven by one thing, I find them interesting. So I did. I I thought it was pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so her main goal is basically to have sex with a human because in this world, so it's pretty much established that you know humans do exist, and these animated characters or these cartoons or comic book characters, whatever you want to call them, also exist in Cool World. So. For her to merge with that world, which she so desperately wants to, the quote-unquote real world, she would have to have sex with a human. Um, and she sees her opportunity with the actual creator of the comic, uh, played by Gabriel Byrne, named Jack Debs. Um, and there is already a human living in Cool World, and that is Brad Pitt's character, Detective Frank Harris. And so he's become... I- I've actually found his interest... Uh, his his character the most interesting one because he's already kind of acclimated to this world Mm -hmm. even though he's an outsider he seems like very comfortable with it and i i found the conceit of you know his his ptsd um you know that being part of his character it's like he's trying to forget his past he's trying to leave the real world behind like in a very literal way and i think that's a really cool um conceit not yeah. to use the word cool so much, but no, but no, uh, but that's an interesting <laughs> point because in the same way that, you know, the Hollywood character is trying to run away from her circumstances and mm-hmm. she's trying, because she sees the grass is greener in the real world. Yeah. The Frank character, uh, the detective played by Brad Pitt, yeah. he sees the cool world as, mm-hmm. you know, a, a, a safe space that he can live in, that he can yeah. kind of put behind the horrors of the real world. So, yeah, so like he has his role there. He's a t- detective there and he's doing his thing and, yeah, it's, it, there's a, definitely a parallel between him and uh, Hollywood's uh, aspirations, I would say. Yeah. Well, and I think the uh, the the cartoonist character, um, what's his name? It's totally escaping me. In the in the film, it's Jack. 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 Harris. Yeah, the cartoonist yeah. character Jack. He, um, I, he. One thing that is worth noting, which kind of doesn't really get hit on that much, interestingly. Mm-hmm. Is that he starts the prison in jail on a murder charge? Yeah, they <laughs> it kind of gets brushed over. They, but did they gloss over that, or did they, I miss something? No, they, they kind of gloss over it a little bit. Okay, but I think what's interesting is even <laughs> even he clearly has something that he's kind of running from. Yeah. So so it is it is it, it is set up really nicely. Yeah, with those three characters, like they, you know, and that's part of when we talk about this film had a lot of potential. I think there are lots of elements in it that are very interesting uh, to keep using that word. I, I, you know, I'm trying to think of a different word, but mm-hmm. it's, it's a fascinating in a way, um, the different aspects of the film. Um, but yeah, I think part of what makes it not work and I'll, I'll go into this a little bit later too, but I think the characters, um, particularly Jack, the creator of the comic, 
I mean, he's he uh, in a sense is supposed to be the central character here. I'm getting the, the the notion when I watch the film anyway, but it seems like they don't either don't focus on him enough or don't yeah. give us enough information about him. Um, like you said, there's a murder charge. He, I mean, we first meet him in prison, and yeah, it's it's um kind of glossed over. And I, I find Brad Pitt the more interesting main character. Um, although I see why they had to have this other you know the creator involved, but yeah, um, I think that's part of maybe what doesn't work about the film is that maybe they don't spend enough time on certain elements or certain aspects of the plot maybe or characters mm -hmm. how do you feel about that yeah i feel like I, I i mean no pun intended but i feel like this movie was kind of a sketch mm -hmm. um Ooh, for good. Yeah, that's good right that's pretty good but this, this movie is kind of a sketch for something that could have been more yeah. refined um it just kind of felt like there were a lot of interesting ideas that mm -hmm. at play but none of them uh were really leaned into which, yeah. as we noted, the backstory of this, originally Bakshi had something kind of totally different in mind, and because of studio pressure, and it ended up being a lot more Roger Rabbit-esque, you know, a lot more of this mystery. With the, and, and I think that ultimately, uh, it to me, feels like a too many cooks in the kitchen kind of situation, yeah. where there were, be, there were a lot of ideas being thrown at it from a lot of different places, and I think that Bakshi maybe just lost his patience with it. I do know that at one point... Um, you know, he had hired a bunch of animators to do background characters and basically told them, just have the characters do whatever that you want them to. I just want them to be moving around yeah. doing weird things the whole time. So uh -huh. it does seem like Bakshi kind of hit his wit's end with this movie. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't feel like, yeah, it doesn't feel like this one was one he passionately saw mm -hmm. all the way through and fought till the mm -hmm. very end to make perfect. It kind right. of felt like he was on a contract and yeah. he did yeah. his best, but... He also wasn't going to push himself past his own mm -hmm. limits to make this great. Exactly. Like, there is still that edginess to it. Mm -hmm. There is that edginess to the characters, I, I feel like. Um, and, and as we said, like, the world, the cool world itself as a world is a, you know, it's a very familiar territory for Bakshi. It's sleazy. Yeah. It's seedy. Um, and certainly deals with themes that we've seen him explore before. And there is a little bit of the edginess to the characters, I think. Um, and I think that's what it makes what makes it different from uh, the more wholesome characters we saw portrayed in Who Framed Roger Rabbit and other films like that. And I think that's another aspect is like what made could have made this movie really, <laughs> really try not to use the word cool, but <laughs> <laughs> it could have made it really cool um, if you know these aspects or elements were explored a little more deeply, Push which farther. I'm sure yeah. actually wanted to. Yeah. So uh, you know we'll get right to it. Like you know. We'll, this one is not known for being a box office smash, um, as we alluded to with the rotten, rotten lost tomatoes. a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, it's actually known for its very uh, storied and troubled production history, and for being a bomb, basically when it was released in theaters. Um, and for people following Ralph Bakshi's story as a filmmaker, which obviously is what we're doing here, uh, it is a fascinating turn, I would say, like in the traje trajectory of his career. Um, in some ways, it is the climax of his career as an animator and a director. Um, so it's intriguing to look at the film in that light and to see what, what led us here, you know, and the films we talked about, like, how do we kind of get to this point? Um, do you see this in some ways, a culmination of what came before Jeremy? Yeah. So, so one thing I, I was saying to Mark right before we started recording here was that in a weird way to me, this is kind of the quintessential Ralph Bakshi film, not in terms of quality, but in terms of everything we've seen previously, you know, as, as we've discussed in previous episodes, this had the street level, um, the street level kind of griminess that we saw in some of Bakshi's earlier work. It had the fantasy elements that we saw in movies like Wizards. It had live action like we saw in Heavy Traffic. It had rotoscoping like we saw in American Pop. So it really, it really does kind of capture everything that Bakshi did throughout his career. I think he just kind of got cut off a little bit. I think personally, mm -hmm. for me, I think this movie would have been a whole different thing if he was allowed to make it R-rated. Yeah. Th this was a PG-13 movie mm -hmm. that was set in what should have been an R-rated world. And I yeah. think because of that, it kind of didn't feel like a more edgy... It, to me, this didn't feel really any more edgy than Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Um, really. I, I mean, I think Who Framed Roger Rabbit well, might be a PG, but it's that was in the mm -hmm. days when PG and PG-13... Actually, I don't even know if I don't even know if PG thirteen existed when Who Framed Roger Rabbit came out. Um, I believe it did. Yeah, or it had think, just been um, yeah. Temple, uh, in Temple of Doom was the first PG thirteen, I believe, which it came out before that, right? Or no, actually, you know what? That came out eighty nine. So, 
You might be right. Yeah, right? I, th- I think it was right around then. So it was PG probably, yeah. Yeah, Who Framed Roger um, Rabbit was PG. Right, okay. So, yeah, like you said, this is P- so Cool World is PG-13, and you can really feel Bakshi holding back from going truly wild. Like, you know, we've seen him doing some of his other films. I mean, mm-hmm. his very first film, Fritz the Cat, was X-rated. Yeah. Uh, you know, and he's he had, there's many stories of him fighting with the studios about ratings and things like that. So this one, yeah, it feels almost kind of... Uh, I don't know, limp. It's like, <laughs> yeah, no, that's you know, a good word for it. That's, that's a perfect that, word for it. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have that oomph to it that uh, his other films have. And so the, you know, there's lots of reasons for the failure and uh, of this film, uh, you know, looking back in hindsight, you can kind of see it there. So as we alluded to a couple of times now, this movie cool world was originally sold as a hard R animated slash live action horror film. And I find this original pitch pretty, pretty fascinating. So the original, um, pitch that back she gave was uh so it was about a um uh basically a cartoon character or i guess comic strip character i'm not sure exactly what it was that was uh was birthed when a human and a animated character got together and she seeks revenge trying to kill her father uh the daughter does so she comes into the real world and tries to slay her father basically <laughs> which is a very dark premise um but one i would you know i would have liked to have seen that um i would have been curious how he would have handled a straight horror film uh with incorporating animation and whatnot yeah um but i, I think could see once... it being really scary like yeah, really definitely, really like scary. Disturbingly yeah. scary yeah yeah um but uh i think once kim, mostly when kim basinger came on board w- was attached to star in the film i think that's when things started to change um, and I think her in the studio probably had talks, most likely without actually even in the room. I mean, who knows? But uh, about the kind of reaction that the movie would generate. Um, and, um, you know, I think it just kind of went from there and it started to soften and the film became PG-13 rated. And that, you know, I don't think it's what she was going for. <laughs> so there's a lot of missed opportunities uh, with the film. Um, but. You know, it, it could have been like a real. I don't think you know. Would it have ever been Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Definitely, I don't think so. No. Um, would it have been a success? Who knows? Uh, would it have been an interesting cult film? Yes, I think yeah. it would be. Um, we consider it a cult film because it is under the radar and all these different aspects. Um, but it, you know, I don't find it a successful cult film. But yeah. it could have been. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Instead, instead, it's just kind of eh. You know, it's like, like it's, I said, it's like, a note in a. It's it's a, a weird note in an amazing career. Exactly. You know, it, yeah. it, it, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting important. way to, yeah. to leave off. Yeah. It's important because Bakshi made it. It's right. it's not important because of yeah. the film. There are some mm-hmm. interesting things happening in the film though. One thing that I would really like to note is so because um you know it was this half animated, half live action world, you would think that all of the sequences taking place in the cool world itself, the animated version of this world, all the backgrounds would be animated. Um, but actually, for some of the backgrounds, what they did is they drew backgrounds and then printed them so they were 12, 13 feet tall. So the live action characters were walking in front of what were basically giant prints instead of real backgrounds, huh. um, which or instead of like green screen backgrounds, which oh, okay. I thought was actually pretty wonderful. I actually um, didn't know that. Yeah, yeah cool. it, 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 you almost don't catch it if, if you're not looking. I only yeah. noticed it because there was one piece of set where I saw like an edge. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. And I kind of looked into it a little bit. But the, first, this this movie in particular, kind of, uh, we keep mentioning him, makes me think of Terry Gilliam because that's the, exactly the kind of thing he would do. You know, like a printed, weird, surreal background that you could go for some kind of realism, but instead you just acknowledge the artifice that film is in and of itself, particularly something where animation is incorporated. Yeah. And I love that they printed the backgrounds. I that's thought really that was, cool, yeah. yeah, it was wildly original. Uh, and and kind of like a, a really innovative approach um, in an era where I think also at that time, you know, green screens were a thing, mm-hmm. you know, we're getting into the 90s here and not computers as, used as they are now, but not yeah, as used. But yeah, but they had the they technology were... to just do all these backgrounds on a green screen. And the fact that they decided that they wanted something hand done about it they wanted that feel and weren't just going to jump on the new technology just because it yeah. was out there i think is commendable and i think that might be a, a battle that Bakshi actually won although mm-hmm. one of not many in this particular case 
Definitely. <laughs> well, this is obviously the most live action we've seen in one of his films so far to this <laughs> point, right? So, um, but I would, you know, as far as techniques go, we've talked about his techniques in other films. Oddly enough, I would say this film is probably the least experimental, um, even though he does incorporate yeah. uh, animation with live action, which is, you know, no easy task. And I'm sure it was kind of a nightmare to shoot and everything. Um, I would say that, like, I don't know, it just it feels like it, other than that, there wasn't too much he did. Like, back, she's kind of known for throwing, you know, like his kitchen sink approach of uh, throwing everything in there, all those different techniques. We saw it a lot in like Wizards and things like that, where during the battle scenes, there would be stock footage going on and rotoscoping and traditional animation and like all these different aspects. So you don't see too much of that. Um, and obviously, I would say the animation, live action integration, um, you know, we, well, we've seen that at play before in his films, but to a much larger, larger degree here. Uh, where the plot actually hinges on it, um, but you know, Roger Rabbit, it ain't. <laughs> yeah. It's still pre it's still pretty impressive in its own way, um, and he does create his own world, like I said. But the actual interactions between the the human characters and the animated characters, I mean, it's in my opinion, they aren't that great. They're a little less convincing than they were done in yeah. uh, in in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which is kind of like you know, you hold that's like the holy grail of these types of films, right? You like hold everything to that light. So that and um, Space Jam, and Classic. Space Jam, of course. Yeah. Well, yeah. We'll have to talk about that on, on future episodes. At some point. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cult film, right? It's got to yeah. be by now. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I feel like... I don't know how you felt. I mean, well, let, let me ask you. How did you feel about the uh, you know, the way that live action was integrated with the animation and vice versa? Do you think it was done well in the, in the film? Do you um, feel like... I, don't, I don't know if done well is the right yeah. term. It almost feels like rushed to me or something. Yeah, like... it, it doesn't totally connect. Um, yeah. Like I said, there were moments that I thought were really interesting more for me in um like i like i mentioned with the with the built sets and everything it was more how the the real live action actors were incorporated into the animated world mm -hmm. i thought that the animated characters weren't as in, weren't incorporated as well into the real world mm -hmm. um i i thought that you know when they were drawn with the real characters it didn't land as much when the yeah. real characters were put in these animated spaces i found that to be interesting what, what about did you, you think about what did you think about the world itself, uh, the actual like cool world that he created for the film? Well, I actually really enjoyed it. Um, I oh. and I think personally, I tend to be drawn towards these kind. I mean, I I love film noir. I mm -hmm. consume it regularly and in large volume. Um, but uh, what what I found interesting about this is there's there's this weird thing, and it, it's hard to explain. It's hard to kind of quantify. But there is this idea of this kind of golden age Hollywood glamour from the you know the i would say like late 40s early 50s this kind of you walk into a club and there's jazz music playing with a beautiful yeah. busty singer you know with her hair done perfectly and the light hitting her mm -hmm. just right and there's a certain thing that for some reason i think you mentioned this is a very 90s feeling thing seemed mm -hmm. to come up a lot in 90s and mm -hmm. and i think that for me i enjoyed the world but i i enjoyed the idea in seeing this as a bigger piece of cinema as a whole and how in cinema and culture we tend to look back at certain times and only take certain elements from those time periods and i and i thought it was interesting the particular um elements that this film chose to pull out of its source material the marilyn monroe thing yeah you know the the jazz music mm -hmm. the the color palettes the cars it, it was it, like like I, yeah. I like the world, but I liked the the curation of the world more than the world itself, I think. Yeah, whereas Who Framed Roger Rabbit was kind of like a noir detective story. This was more of like a neo-noir. It was almost like yeah. a fantasy noir um, or like a Sin City kind of world. Well, it almost um, felt like, interestingly, a few years later, L.A. Confidential, yeah, which a bit. Kim Basinger maybe <laughs> got that role because of this, you know, they. Oh yeah. which is right. totally possible. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a great movie, and this had a similar kind of derivative it's not supposed to be actually yeah. the 1940s it's supposed to be the 1940s through rose tinted glasses mm -hmm. yeah and i always have i have a soft spot for certain things like i've always liked the idea of a completely invented world in films like when they completely make it from scratch and and it's it's, it's very like self-contained and you yeah. know I, I always enjoy that so it's it's fascinating to me when someone essentially creates their own universe and you know the choices they make to fill that world and things like that. And I do like the characters that inhabit it. I mean, they're very cartoony. <laughs> the cartoons are very cartoony. Go figure. As are the live action. Um, I mean, 
the, yeah. the way these characters are portrayed, like Brad Pitt is not trying yeah. to portray a real for him, police officer. He's doing a cartoonish, you know, Humphrey yeah. Bogart version. Right. Of, but for him, like for his character, I thought it made sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like the actual cartoons are very cartoony. Like they randomly morph into things like you see, like in the older cartoons, like Warner Brothers and stuff like mm-hmm. that, uh, do things that no human could do. Um, and I like that. And in a lot of ways, I saw it as actually kind of paying tribute to the cartoons he grew up on and that inspired him. Um, and and ones that, you know, when he worked at Terry Toon, Terry Toons and stuff, he you know, when he he would be part of that system. And I think he genuinely enjoyed that kind of animation. And, and I think, um, you know, that's what he was inspired by. And obviously he puts his own twist on it, but I think it's all there um, in this film, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, So yeah, I like that aspect of it. uh, The actual world building of it. But again, it feels a little to me, I I thought disjointed and a little, almost a little too vague for its own good. Like it just doesn't, you know, it, if you had to des- describe what Cool World actually was, like, and the the characters that inhabit it, I don't, I don't know if you'd be able to. It's, yeah. you know, well, and if that's, place. yeah, and if that's part of, you know, an issue with the script, like the screenplay, or if that's the producers or who, the studio, who knows? Who I knows? Mean, yeah, it was a it while could be ago. Anyone, but um, it was a while ago. It, <laughs> it was, was ninety two. I mean, well, so at this point, you know. Yeah. No, no, I'm saying yeah, definitely. Yeah. It, um. So, um, Mark, any favorite moments or closing notes? Closing notes. Um favorite moments let me think um i don't know if any moments stuck out really it was just like yeah i don't know if there's any moments that stuck (laughs) yeah which is fair i I, you know oddly enough for this film which is weird like because i talked about when i was a kid and i remember this being on tv like seeing commercials for it and things like that oddly enough the trailer for this film always stuck out to me and Mm -hmm. i think part of the reason is because when you well part of it's you know i was a kid and i would see this trailer and be like what is this you know like this looks so awesome and uh you know and and just the way the the film was portrayed in those trailers um as we know sometimes trailers aren't you know they they lie to us a little bit a little bit a little bit forthcoming so uh so to me, I remember the trailer more than anything. And I just remember the feeling like that trailer gives you like, this is going to be a really kind of like dark, like cool, gritty, uh, who framed Roger Rabbit, which is what I think he set out to make, but ultimately not really what the film became. Um, did you have any moments that, that you enjoyed with the film? Um, I mean, yeah, there were little moments here and there. I, I think I really enjoyed the backgrounds. Like yeah, both the backgrounds the, are great. Yeah, like yeah, like, like, like elements the, of the film are, are yeah. interesting. Yeah, like it is hard to just pick one specific moment and say, "Oh, that was so great." Um, yeah. Well, one thing that I did like was kind of the transition when the 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 Hollywood character turns into a real person. I thought that was oh, done that was kind cool. Of, yeah, that was, was cool. That was something in the trailer too. Like they showed that part in there, and I I liked how yeah they did that with the uh, kind of cutting back and forth, like the kind of jump cuts of, of him, yeah. them being cartoon and then being human. That yeah, so cool. yeah. I thought that was interesting. One thing yeah. that it, it wasn't even in the movie, but that I just thought was so wonderful was apparently in the promotion for this movie, they oh, made yeah, I, I a, want to talk about this. Yeah, they made a gigantic cutout of the Hollywood character and right. had her sitting on top of the Hollywood sign. Uh, which which shows that apparently, you know, Paramount obviously believed in this film's yeah. eventual success because you wouldn't just do that if you were like, oh, this this thing's going to bomb, you know? So Mm-hmm. I, you know it's a publicity stunt that's huge and apparently, it's wonderful like, it's wonderful it's fucking it, it, brilliant up, part of my friend did you but... look up um pictures of it did you look up it yeah yeah it? it's yeah. great and and i would highly recommend um yeah. looking it up if you have the chance because it's it's hysterical it's, it's like also, it's so surreal it's just hyster- it is very surreal and it's hysterical that it angered so many people too. yeah people <laughs> like were all furious. the local residents were like what are you doing like, which is is funny to me personally yeah. And, and like first we live off, in Hollywood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So first off, this sign was huge. Like we're not talking about like a little tiny like like this this sign was about as big as one of the letters on the Hollywood sign. Um, which I wonder as as my background in addition to movies is also graphic design. And I have a feeling it would probably be really hard to see what it actually is from far away. So people are probably just like, what's that thing on top of the D in the Hollywood yeah. sign? Um but also if you live in Hollywood, you have to I would imagine, I mean, like, I live in New York, and you don't, you don't, you hit a point where you don't question weird promotional things coming into your life after a while, so I find it very bizarre that anyone would be even slightly upset by (laughs) a Hollywood film doing the most classic Hollywood promotion you could possibly Mm. imagine. Um, Yeah, 
So I, I think it's wonderful, personally. Yeah, and again, Hollywood is uh, sort of a, a fascinating character. I mean, I think maybe she wasn't handled great in the within the film, but mm-hmm. she's. I saw her as like kind of like a Jessica Rabbit rabbit. I can't go back to yeah. Who Framed Roger Rabbit again, but kind of mm-hmm. like a Jessica Rabbit rabbit if she was completely let loose, like yeah, you know, literally just all she wants is to get laid. Um, yeah, so, or like a a Rita, you know. Yeah, uh, kind of like that. Or not Rita. Um, I just totally blanked on that rita hayworth what's the movie a gilda yeah, gilda okay. like a gilda I know, character i know, character, I know, I know what you're talking about though. <laughs> that's right yeah and i had the actress right no yeah like a gilda character yeah. any classic you mm-hmm. know hollywood noir yeah femme yeah. fatale she she fits right in there and and you feel her longing too like there's a, a line actually noted here is she said when they you know she hollywood's talking about humans and how she wants to feel the power that a human feels and she mm-hmm. says when they touch something they really touch it you know it's so there are aspects of this film that I think are worth exploring, uh, you know, and I think maybe in another, who knows, maybe Ralph actually, you know, he's pretty old now, but maybe he can still tackle something uh, like this. But um, I, and I do want to leave just on one other anecdote because I found this interesting <laughs> um, regarding his uh, Bakshi's fight with the studio. Um, so there's this character, uh, Frank Minisco. Well, he's a real person, but. Frank Minesco Jr., um, he is kind of known for, he doesn't have the best reputation in Hollywood, and he was a producer on this film, and apparently Ralph Bakshi was almost fired and sued by Frank Minesco because he punched him uh, in the nose <laughs> after he told him this film was being changed. So uh, that just shows you, but it also shows you how Bakshi, you know, how fiery he is, how passionate he is. Um, and it, he just doesn't give a damn. Like he just, you know, he he really wants what he wants. But I mean, I think ultimately in the end, he had to concede and give in to the studio because he just didn't have a choice at at a certain point. Um, so he gave in to the studio and to the star because apparently um, Basinger, you know, as good as she is in this movie, she was expecting something very different. And there's a really uh, funny quote um, when back she's talking about this. I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but he's discussing what. Kim Basinger as an actress thought this film was going to be uh and she said something along the lines of I want I want sick children in hospitals to be able to watch Cool World <laughs> and which he's, is so absurd and it was pretty much like this it ain't that movie you know like, this ain't he, it uh, like have you, you know? have you seen anything I've made exactly you know? it's like, like it's just completely clueless so I <laughs> um I found that pretty funny and that kind of sums up like what you know what how the main actress and the studio was viewing the film and how back she was viewing it. So two completely different uh, personalities and, and uh, you know, and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, philosophies, I guess, um, for this film. So in direct conflict with each other, in direct conflict, uh, especially when he punched him in the nose, which is great. Yeah. Um, so this film was a failure as we discussed. Um, and I'm sure back. took it pretty hard because he was coming out of a slump before this and I'm sure he thought this would be something, you know, and he put a lot of work into it as he always does. And it came out and kind of just flopped. And so we'll talk about a little bit uh, just after this film, what he went on to do. Uh, not too much. He went on to, uh, uh, I guess, immediately following this was the, the next thing he did was a short lived animated series for HBO called Spicy City which from what I've seen shares a lot thematically with Cool World, the actual like look and feel of it. Um, and he had that for, I think it's only six episodes or something like that. It's, it's one season. Um, it did not get renewed. Uh, I think I read into that a little bit and eventually HBO wanted to change that. So he ran into the same issue where someone was trying to control his work. And so he left and he all but left Hollywood and now mostly uses his art, artistry skills to paint. He does a lot of painting now. Um, and one other thing I want to touch on was the film Last Days of Coney Island, which was, uh, as of 2019, when we were recording this, the last film that Bakshi has created himself and made. It's a short film. Uh, and he, it, this is interesting because, um, so in 2013, Bakshi launched a Kickstarter campaign. Very new thing, obviously, and he was able to obtain funding for this film. Uh, Last Days of Coney Island was something he had in the in the back of his head for a long time, something he wanted to make for a long time. And the actor uh, Matthew Modine was actually cast in the film, and he was a longtime Bakshi fan apparently. And he came, you know, when he came across the Kickstarter, he helped he helped get some momentum to it. So it was released on Vimeo in 2019, Last Days of Coney Island. And 
I have seen the film and I actually really enjoyed it. Um, I, it was, it was actually when it came out, uh, it was when I saw it. So I don't remember it, you know, verbatim or anything, but it's very Bakshi, um, you know, cause I was a little worried using newer technology. Uh, it's still traditionally animated, but he finished it using digital technology and newer technology, which for him was great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's a great quote about that. Actually, I want to read very quickly here. Um, he's quoted as saying, uh, the animation is probably higher quality than anything I ever made at a cost so low, it's embarrassing. Everything I used to do in my old movies that required hundreds of people and huge salaries is now done in a box. It took 250 people to make heavy traffic. Now I'm down to five. I kiss the computer every morning. Yeah. So obviously happy that it didn't take as long and that he didn't need as much manpower and he was able to complete this film. And I think it's worth checking out, especially if you've gone on this journey with us. I think it's it's worth seeing. It's still very Bakshi. It's, it touches on a lot of the themes that he's touched on before and that we've seen him uh, explore. But in a different, it's different to see, uh, you know, with that digital sheen on it. It's a little different, and it's it's worth checking out. Um, so- I do think that I do think that that quote is kind of maybe the perfect way to wrap up our series on Bakshi yeah. here, though, in a way because Definitely. you know Ralph Bakshi is is a real artist who mm-hmm. who has vision. He's determined and he, he's happy to use any technology, mm-hmm. any, any people, anything he can get his hands on to make the work as best as it can possibly be made. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's not precious. He, he just wants to create and create and create. And he's someone who has had to fight to do that. Definitely. And he's someone who's won some battles and lost some battles, but really left behind a, a pretty terrific legacy of wonderful, wonderful films that I personally couldn't recommend more. Definitely. He really is a, a true auteur, as you said. And uh, whether you're in animation, whether you're not into animation, if you're into anything non-mainstream, I would say definitely check out his films. It's very much worth it. And obviously, if you've if you listen to the series, you probably have already checked them out. Hopefully you have. Um, but recommend not, them to people. Tell people yes, about the film. Yes, tell others to watch Ralph Bakshi films. Uh, they'll thank you later. So that's going to, I think, do it for us uh, for the Ralph Bakshi series here, the animated world of Ralph Bakshi. So tune in next time. We're going to go into a whole new subject and explore a whole new series of films. Thanks for listening to Cult Movie Cult. You can find us on iTunes, Podbean, and Spotify, as well as on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. If you have any cult films you'd like to hear us discuss on the show, or if you'd like to officially join the cult and be a guest on the show, please feel free to reach out to us at cultmoviecult at gmail.com. This has been Cult Movie Cult, and until next time, so long from the other side.